Um, welcome, Eli Kim. Hello. Is this working? Yeah. Oh, my God. I don't know why you guys are listening to me. <laughs> All right. Let's do this. Seatbelts, everyone! Please let this be a normal field trip with a friend. No way! All right. I really wanted to play the whole clip, but I was told that a minute was too long, so I had to clip it to that. You'll have to deal with it. Uh, that's me. I'm Eli. I'm known as Monkey Patcher on Twitter and Instagram, if you're into that. Um, and Elijah Kim on GitHub. This is the obligatory I work at Frame. Um, Frame.io is a video review and collaboration platform that helps video teams of all sizes produce better video together. Excuse me. We process over 100,000 video uploads per day for my 500,000 users and are used by teams such as Vice, BuzzFeed, Turner, and NASA. A lot of our core platform is powered by Elixir, having run it in production for nearly a year. Anyway, uh, back to me. I've been writing Elixir for about three years. I have terrible stage fright, if you can't notice already. Um, I've never spoken at a conference before, uh, it's first time, and I have crazy amounts of imposter syndrome. Thank you. I was about to do some live coding, but I decided against that. Um, but anyway, uh, let's go on. All right. Uh, today we'll cover what an event bus is, why you should use one, um, how we use our event bus at Frame. Uh, we'll go over building an event bus, uh, some lessons learned after a year in production, and tons of lists along the way. So what's an event bus? This is the definition I found at ribbit.org, which I think is like a Java event bus. But you can think of it as a giant megaphone. Uh, it receives messages and passes it al along to all of its consumers. And with all tech things, there's a ton of jargon, so we'll get, at, we'll get that out of the way first. Um, message or event is any object that can be posted to the bus. A consumer, a listener, a subscriber, a component are pretty much all things that want to receive events and hopefully do something with them. And you'll hear to post in this talk, which is to pass or send an event. Um, and this is all pretty abstract. Hopefully this example brings it a little, makes it a little more concrete. Um, there's no crazy animations here, so you just have to close your eyes. Uh, so when you think of a four-way intersection, um, the cars never really talk to each other. You never like roll down the windows, scream, it's time for you to go. Um, but instead, there's a traffic light that kind of acts as an event bus. Um, it sends three different types of messages, uh, red, yellow, green, uh, to communicate to the cars at whatever lane that they're on that it's, it's their time to go. So in this case, the cars act as consumers, and the traffic light acts as an event bus. Um, you could even consider the sensors as some, something that communicates to the event bus, which it then translates it into the lights. How am I doing? Cool. All right, so there are a ton of pros to use an event bus. Uh, the, main is that the, the main reason you should use one is that the logic for a particular side effect is isolated. Uh, what this means is you never have a mix of concerns. Um, so if you have like an email service and a push not notification service, those two pieces of code will never be in the same file. Um, better yet, uh, as you'll see down the line, the code for like creating a user will have nothing to do with sending an email. It also isolates errors. So if you have like an email service and for some reason you push up bad code, it won't affect your whole system, hopefully. Uh, and lastly, bringing up a new consumer is really easy. Uh, if you have the infrastructure set in place, all you have to do is maybe like spin up another gen server to consume some events. And with pros, there always comes cons. Our job is just picking trade-offs. Uh, integration testing is really difficult. Um, if you want to do a test where if you create a user and an email is sent uh, through this event bus, you, you do have to ensure that it's up. 
uh, deployments harder. Um, you might have to manage multiple VMs. And you have to also worry about drop messages. Uh, Paul's talk at the end of the day yesterday shows that like, these messages are really hard to make sure that they're all in order. So if you look at this code snippet, it looks fine. Um, it's not that bad, right? Uh, it takes some params, it inserts it into the database, and if it works, we send an email. Um, and we ship it, it's fine. Three months later, we have a PM that comes back and says we have to implement push notifications. So you add another function at the end of the pipeline, um, send push notification. You have like two more function heads where you, you know, just handle those cases, and you ship it, it's fine. Um, but eventually, it turns into something like this, where you have to push, maybe send some push notifications, you implement webhooks, you want audit logs, you want to send an SMS, et cetera. And it looks like this, where you, know, you just get deeper, and then suddenly you're just like, taken over by the wave. Um, and like, it really doesn't scale, right? Um, we duplicate this code, where like, all those side effects, are you still watching this? All right. Um, <laughs> where all those side effects, um, and you have to implement those for like every service function, for like every CRUD operation, for every resource. Like every time someone signs in, every time someone leaves a comment, like it's just gonna get out of hand. And there's a better way, and I hope this is you, um, or this. And uh, th th there is, I promise. Uh, so this is what our code on a high level looks like. Uh, there's uh, a context function, which is responsible for like, the core business logic. Um, it's responsible for like, authorizing users, see if they're allowed to do it or not. Um, anything that has to happen on the spot, like maybe taking money, you probably don't want to make that async. Uh, and the last thing it's responsible for is sending the event to the event bus. The event bus then like, shouts to all the consumers, hey, this thing happened, and then each consumer is able to handle that handle that message as it wants to. So instead of having that huge pipeline, we change our code to something like this. Uh, the, the one like black boxy thing here is notify. And if things go well, we send out, we call this handle notify function. Um, and what that does is it standardizes the, the message that we get into a struct um, that we use and then post it to the event bus. And our events look like this. Uh, before we pass the user created, and we have this mac using macro called event, and all it does is it creates a struct uh, with some like standardized keys so that our consumers know exactly what to expect. God, how do you all like talk for 30 minutes? Mm. Right. <clears throat> so with these messages, um, we we create this protocol for like whatever things we have to handle. And in this case, we have a trackable protocol. And what it does is it receives any sort of event and then make, turns it into a track. Uh, we also have this fallback to any, which means if we don't want to handle the message, we just pass an OK tuple, or sorry, an OK atom. If we do want to, um, we define this implementation for trackable for that event and do whatever we need to there. So this makes our consumers uh, very light. Um, we have this base consumer, which I could talk about a little bit later, and all it has to do is call track on that event and enqueue it, which if it receives an OK, then like pretty much no ops. Otherwise, uh, we send it to our batch, our batch processor. So that's pretty cool. And I promised we'd make an event bus, so here we go. Uh, the requirements are that we subscribe to the event bus, uh, we post an event to the event bus. We make sure we broadcast the events. And our final criteria is that we don't overload our consumers. This is the API that we'll slowly fill in. And this is the first example. Um, it just uses a gen server underneath. Oh, OK. So Starlink and init, like these are all functions that you know that you have to implement when you're using a gen server. In this case, we. Give it a name over there just so it's easy to call later, and we initialize it with an empty list of subscribers. 
uh, get subscribers, takes the subscribers, passes it back as a response. Subscribe just appends the subscribers, uh, sorry, the PID to the subscribers. And this is where like, the broadcasting bit happens, right? Uh, all it does is it takes, for every sub subscriber, we send the message to that subscriber, and that's it. Uh, filled in, it looks like this. And I ran a benchmark. Uh, I had to keep the numbers low because eventually it gets really slow. Um, but it's really fast. We sent like 1,000 messages in a few microseconds, which is crazy. Um, but we don't meet the criteria of not overloading con our consumers. Um, in this case, we just fire and forget, and hopefully the consumer can handle it. So here's a slightly better example. Uh, we pretty much just have an act here. Um, for each subscriber, we, uh, we pass the message as a call and wait for the OK, um, as seen there. And this is an example of a mock consumer. We just initialize it uh, and sleep for a random, random time, in this case, anywhere between 100 to 500 milliseconds. And then we just send the response back. Uh, our benchmark changes a little bit, where I start mock consumers instead of passing itself as a subscriber. And I try running the benchmark, and it's just not going to happen. It's way too slow. And the reason why is because here, we have to wait for the act. Um, we go through subscriber per subscriber and making sure we, make sure we wait till we re receive a response, which means that if you have like one subscriber in here that's really slow, it, it, just, it just takes way too long. And we could do this even slightly better. Um, and we do that by using task async stream. Um, what that does is it takes the subscribers and passes each one to a function and starts a task for it, and then waits for everything to come back. Uh, the problem here is that, uh, let's say the call doesn't return an OK, it'll probably crash the event bus, which kind of sucks. But hey, we, we got to do it anyway. And um, it finished the benchmark in around 55 seconds. It went from 300 microseconds to 55 seconds. That's, I think, a couple orders of magnitude. Um, but that's because we have to make sure we don't overload our consumers. Uh, there's a better -er, er way. And um, you do this by going to this blog post, uh, announcing Gen Stage, <laughs> um, which leads you here. Uh, if you don't know what Gen Stage is, it's a behavior. I'm going like, to just read it off for exchanging events with back pressure between Elixir processes. This is like exactly what we want in the case of not overloading consumers. Um, you scroll down. Anyway, let's, you scroll down. Uh, you copy all the code, and you paste it in. So this is, this is our event bus, right? Um, this stuff stays, stays the same. Uh, you do have to, in the init, you have to say that it's a producer. Um, we initialize it with an empty queue. And we have to say that it's a broadcast dispatcher, because we want to broadcast all the events to all the consumers. Um, notify just takes whatever you want, to, whatever event it gets, and puts it into the queue. And handle demand is what we have to implement. In this case, we just we pop whatever demand we get from the queue and pass it along. Uh, our mark consumer changes a little bit as well. Um, we have to implement this handle events. I think I have a box for it. Yeah, um, and we sleep for each event, you know, just to make it fair. And it, it actually turns out it's a little bit slower than task async stream. Um, it finished at 150 seconds as opposed to task async stream, which finishes in 55. And you have to keep in mind that gen stage, in my opinion, really isn't a performance mechanism, although it's really fast. Um, what gen stage gives you is a is pull-based rather than push-based events. Um, but because of that, we're able to get rid of our ACK completely. But wait, there's more. Uh, there's betterest. I hope this works. Oh, the sound's gone. There's a beep beep at the end, but you didn't get to hear it. <laughs> so the betterest uh, implementation uses consumer supervisor. 
And what that does is it spawns a task, kind of like task async stream, or sorry, it spawns a child process for each event that comes in. Uh, so the, we use consumer supervisor, our init changes a little bit, and we have this worker that spawns, uh, that spawns uh, sleeps for a certain time, and dies. And it's really fast. It finished in like around 300 milliseconds, which I think is as fast as it can get, because we have a sleep in there from 100 to 500 milliseconds. And to show how consumer supervisor works, I have a, a small demo. Let's see. Let's see if I can do this right. OK. Let's see this. Um, so our application looks like this. We just spawn the event bus and the mock consumer. Um, and mock consumer looks like this. Nothing really changed. Uh, line 11, we have a max demand of five, just so we could show it going in and out. And the sleeps got a little longer, so we could see the PIDs changing. At least I'm not live coding. Uh, so we start mix, so we could start the observer. Observer. Cool. And then you could see the event bus running and our consumer supervisor. And we can send an event. If I. Hello. And you could see the pit pop up. And after maybe five seconds ish, you'll disappear. But the cool thing is if you do something like this. You can, hello. You'll see the task pop up, and then you'll see the, the can you read that? You can, you can read the PIDs, and they'll cycle through as the, as the tasks die off. So when one dies off, supervisor spawns another one, and it'll slowly go through all of these events, um, all 10,000 of them, which will probably take a really long time. That's the demo. I breezed through this. Damn. <laughs> All right. So um, our event bus processes around 1.5 million events per day. Uh, at a peak at around 2.2. Um, and it takes about 0 0.01 uh, nanoseconds for us to consume each event, which means like all of our background jobs, uh, like emails, push notifications, all that happens in the short span of time. Um, and our P99 for our API for the last three months has been 101 milliseconds, which I think is pretty awesome. Um, and a year later, uh, like in retrospect, this pattern actually works really great. Um, recently, we implemented webhooks. Well, I didn't do it. Steve did it. And he did it in like two weeks because we had all of these events already passing through. So he just spawned a consumer for the webhook and was able to just listen in on the events that came in. Um, yeah, this is still a thing. And I think we're OK with it. We unit test our functions really well. Um, all of our servers functions are tested in a way that we can guarantee that the event is sent off. And all of our consumers have tests to make sure we can consume every single message that's passed in. Uh, the cool thing is our event bus really isn't a bottleneck. Um, and if it does, we can easily replace it. Uh, a few slides back, we have this handle demand function. Like, if you want to rip it out and maybe put in Kafka instead, we could just put it in there and then have handle demand pull in messages from Kafka, maybe, in theory. Uh, that was my talk. And I have to thank, oh, I lost my notes. I have to thank Frame for sending me down here. Uh, Chris, I have to plug his podcast because Desmond isn't here to do it for him. If you like listening to a British guy telling him he's wrong, you should listen to Elixir Talk. Uh, Michael, Zach, and Steve for enduring all of my practices, and also to Brian, Joseph, and Nikki for having me down here. Thank you. Thanks. 
Uh, qu okay, question. <laughs> Uh, this is a good talk. Thanks. I really appreciate it. Thank um, you. So you're definitely not the first person that I've heard kind of uh, shout this strategy from the rooftops of like a lot of the uh, just the benefits have kind of far outweighed the cons for a lot of people. Um, but one of the things I've noticed has been troubled a trouble for me when I've tried to use it is the indirection between you know you know that this thing starts an event, but you're looking at it and you're thinking okay no, what's going to happen right like when I do this you know, 30 things might happen. How do I find all of those things and how do I know what they are? Um, and, you know, I've been told the trade-off is worth it, the trade-off is worth it. But I'm curious if you, if you've developed strategies now doing this for a year to make that easier, to be able to draw those lines a little bit easier and sort of predict how your system's gonna behave? Um, I mean, luckily we don't have like 30 consumers. Maybe there's like 10. Um, and the best thing I've, I have is like I just grab for the event. Um, we have like a list of events that we like that all use that event macro, and they're all in one file. So we could at least see what events are fired, and we could grab for that. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, any other questions? Great talk. Um, couldn't tell that, that that was your first time. Thank you. Unless you told us. Uh, which you did. Um, <laughs> how do you guys handle um, like disaster recovery? Like, I, I'm still pretty new to, to Elixir, but uh, it seems like there's, uh, since this is all handled with processes, you know, if you lose the nodes, like you might lose any kind of events uh, that haven't been processed. Yeah, so disasters aren't really something we handle really well. Um, in the past year, we did implement like retries and failure logs. Uh, but as I mentioned, like one of our cons is that like you do have to worry about drop messages. Um, we don't really have a persistence layer for it yet, but it's something that's in the works. I was also going to ask a question about persistence, but since so that was just asked, um, the um, I guess what I was going to mention um, in, that I guess one of the nice things about doing the consumers as processes is if you want to figure out like what's going to happen, you can just look at what processes are running that are like under that consumer list. So it's kind of neat. Um, and I do happen to know that um, Jose, who wrote GenStage, is kind of working on a version of that that'll have a, a, a mechanism for hooking in persistence. So hopefully this should get easy, a lot easier soon. Is Paul here? Uh, All right, great. <laughs> uh, you mentioned Kafka in passing kind of towards the end. Yeah. Um, it's a technology we're sort of maybe looking at uh, where I work as well. Uh, we're for now using sort of like a gen stage thing in, uh, in place of that. Um, can you walk me through sort of like what you guys have been thinking, why you chose to not go with it initially, why you might in the future, that kind of thing? Um, so I have a secret, and that is I joined after the gen stage thing was made. Um, so I can't really tell you why and what decisions, what thought processes went through. But I can tell you that like it's worked fine, and we don't have to worry about deploying Kafka. Maybe that's something. Cool. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Sorry, I, I think you may have said, but how many consumers are you typically spinning up versus the broadcasters or publishers? Um, I think anywhere between 10 and 12. I haven't checked recently. I mean, we just added the webhook one. Um, and we also don't have to worry. Oh, don't worry about it. <laughs> okay, cool. Going once, going twice. Okay, thank you, Eli. Thanks.